about that. Um, Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to be starting in verse 23 this morning. Finishing up the chapter, making our way through Hebrews, and uh, still got a little bit, a little bit left to get through, and, and actually probably my favorite parts of the book are coming up, and so I'm excited to get there, but today we're in Hebrews 9 verse 23, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for this morning, for giving us this time and space, Lord, and, and these people, Lord, to worship you with, Lord. We worship you through your word, or through song, worship you through our giving, we worship you through your word, we worship you through our fellowship and our gifts that we give, our gifts that we have here for the profit of the whole church. And Lord, just so excited to see what you're going to do in us and through us, now through your word. And so I pray we would allow your word to do its work in us. Lord, that we would not just be hearers of your word, but doers, that you would be glorified in all portions of our life, all days of our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 23. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him who will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Now, the future is something that scares a lot of people. It causes a lot of fear and anxiety. In fact, I know that they've done studies that a lot of people my own age and younger than me are deciding not to have kids. And in fact, it's worrying some countries and world leaders because, uh, you know, the population has to grow because people are dying. And so if people are dying, you have to have people born in order to replenish the population. So it's scaring people and they're deciding not to have kids. Why? Because they're afraid of the future. Why would I bring my kid into a world that just looks like chaos right now? Where it all seems like at any moment it could just end. And that's that's one example. For some of us, the future that causes us fear and anxiety is that, that meeting we have this week. That bill that's due next month. That thing that you put off for too long. Many people think that they're just better off blocking out what comes so they can just enjoy the present. But as we'll see, and as probably a lot of us know by experience, that's really a lie from the enemy. It has deceived many into an eternity of judgment that don't worry about the future. Just enjoy the present. Don't think about your future. Enjoy what you're doing now. And it sounds good, right? It sounds like a good way to live. Live in the present. Be in the now. Don't worry about the future. And and actually, in the Bible, we're told not to worry about the future. What they've done is they've taken that and then twisted it. But in contrast of the deception from the enemy, the good news of the gospel declares that our future is safe and sure in the hands of the Father if we put our trust in in the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. And that's what the author's going to get at here this morning with what well, he's writing to these Christians here, these Jewish believers that were possibly wanting to go back to the old law. And so going back to verse 23, he says, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now, to understand what he's saying than these you have to go back to the verses before this and he's talking about the regular sacrifices at the tabernacle the regular sacrifices of the temple the blood of bulls oxen goats he goes it was necessary that the copies of the things 
in the heavens, which was the tabernacle, all the offerings. They were just copies of what Jesus would eventually do. And at this point, what Jesus already did. The things of the law, the sacrifices and the offerings, they were mere earthly things. They were sacrifices that were from this earth, built by things on this earth, and they stayed on this earth. Right? Think of the tabernacle. What was it made out of? It was made out of wood and gold and badger skins and all these other things. And where did that come from? From the earth. And what happened with those things? Well, they stayed on earth. What did they use as sacrifices and offerings? Things from the earth. Things that have been affected by the curse. The contrast that the author makes in regard to the offering of Christ compared to the offerings found in the law is that Christ offerings do not just affect earth, but they affect heaven. He says but at the end of this verse, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The tabernacle and its ordinances, they were simply copies and pointed everyone to the one true Messiah, the one true lamb slain. Everything that they did was pointing to Jesus. In fact, that's what really blew the mind of the disciples and those there, especially in the first century Jews. Paul says in, in some of his letters that you know he thought he knew the law. He thought he knew what the law meant and what it was for. But once he saw Jesus, he realized, oh, he's the fulfillment of all these things. In fact, I, I love the story of after Jesus' resurrection, when he meets his two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they're all sad because, you know, and they're, they think that Jesus is still dead. And as he's walking around along the road with them and they don't recognize him, you know, he says, why are you guys so sad? And they're like, where have you been? <laughs> and, you know, our, our, the guy that we thought was the Messiah, he's in a tomb down the road. He's dead. And Jesus takes the time, he says, from the beginning, shows them that from the beginning, it was pointing to that death. And that resurrection, and finally, they, you know, he makes himself known to them. And they're like, whoa, <laughs> it's you. But he doesn't say, I, I do, I'm doing something different. I'm doing something new. No, what he was doing is saying, all of these things pointed to this. This was all setting up Jesus' death and resurrection. Another example of this is Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. If you remember, the Lord, the Holy Spirit tells Philip to go out into the middle of the desert where no one's at while he's leading a successful ministry. He's having, you know, he's having a mega church being built and he says, I want you to go to the middle of nowhere. There's one guy I need you to talk to. <laughs> he goes out there, he sees the Ethiopian eunuch in his chariot and what is he reading? He's reading the scroll of Isaiah and he's not reading one of those weird parts. <laughs> He's reading a part that's exactly talking about the death of Jesus. And, and the Ethiopian eunuch says, well, who's going to explain this to me? And Philip goes, well, <laughs> good thing I'm here, right? And he explains how all of that was talking and pointing to the death of Jesus. And then the interesting part of that story, all of a sudden Philip's hundreds of miles away. Kind of like he got teleported. But all of these things, and this is nothing new for us. This is something the author's been talking about these past few chapters. But all of these things were copies. Shadows. They weren't the real deal. God never intended the blood of bulls and goats to take away the sins of the world. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, he didn't say, all right, then I guess we're just going to have to kill a bunch of animals if you guys want to make me happy. He didn't set up the tabernacle and say, all right, here's the quota you have to meet in order to make me happy. And it's not like they didn't meet the quota and God's up in heaven saying, you know what, we need something better than this. This isn't working like I intended it to work. No, it was working exactly as he intended it to work. 
It was supposed to be a band-aid. It was supposed to be a covering. It wasn't supposed to be the real deal. It was pointing them to eventually that Christ would come. Continuing on in verse 24, he says, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now in the Old Covenant, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, which is where the presence of God was said to dwell. He was to go in there once a year after he had first made atonement for his sins. That's something we've looked at previously in Hebrews. That the high priest had to make sacrifices for his own sins, something Jesus never had to do. He went in once a year to this Holy of Holies, the inner court for the tabernacle. It was the innermost part for the temple also, the innermost part, separated by a thick veil. But again, all of this was done where? On earth. How were they built? They were built with hands, with things from this earth. What happened to those sacrifices? Did they rise up into heaven? Oh, they stayed on earth. They came from the earth. They stayed on the earth. Like Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, you know, we came from dust and to dust we will return. The only thing that happened is the the smoke was a pleasing aroma that rose to the Lord and sweet smelling aroma. But the sacrifices were dead and they were on earth. And they had to do, do a new one every single year. Every single year we have to offer a new sacrifice. Bring a goat from the earth. But the sacrifice of Christ was different. Look again what he says at the beginning of verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands. He did die and his sacrifice was pleasing to the Lord, but he did not stay dead. He's still not here on this earth. Everyone else, you can find their, well, now everyone else, you can't find their grave, right? We don't know where Moses is buried. But after three days, he rose again. And shortly after that, he rose, after he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven. The ascension of Jesus is vital to the Christian faith. Without the ascension, then we no longer have an advocate in heaven interceding for us. Without Jesus ascending into heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, who is making intercession for us? Well, really, it would be up to us. And guess what? If it were up to us, we wouldn't be getting very far. This is what Paul says in Romans 8, verses 33 and 34. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Christ is up in heaven in the full presence of God at his throne making intercession for us constantly. He is our advocate. In our own day and age, it would be like our defense lawyer, our defense attorney. Constantly showing that the price has already been paid. Because we're told in Revelation, we have an accuser of the brethren, Satan, who's always pointing at what we've done. And guess what? He's got a good case. (laughs) We did it. He's not lying. But the difference is, is the debt's already been paid. Christ says, I've already paid for that. I've already died for that. There's no judgment that needs to come upon that because it's been paid. And so he says here that we have Jesus Christ not coming into an earthly sanctuary built with hands that had to get moved and picked up and, you know, it it was in a physical place. If you wanted to worship the Lord, you had to physically go to this place. In fact, when the 
the kingdom of Israel split into Israel and Judah, the northern and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom said, you know what? It would be weird if we, because we split from, from them. It'd be weird if we went back down to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. So guess what? We're just going to say, not that God's told us, not that God's declared it to us. We're just going to say, we're just going to worship at Bethel. This sounds like a good spot to worship. We're going to say that this is now where we can also meet God's presence. And that wasn't true at all. But with Christ, we have an advocate who's always with the Father. We don't have to be in a certain place to have our sins atoned for. Because we have one who went to God for us and is there right now making intercession for us. Look at verse 25 as he continues. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now see, this is one of the biggest differences between the offering of Christ and any of the other offerings. As we've looked before in Hebrews, the offerings made by the high priest in the Old Covenant were made on an annual basis. Every year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest couldn't go in, you know, hey, you know, the king's been suffering with sin. I think this, I can go in now. No, it was only on the Day of Atonement. It wasn't like, you know, uh, you know I, I might have some other plans that day as the high priest. Can we, can we move the date? No, nope. only on the Day of Atonement an annual basis and he had to offer goats every single time they couldn't use the one from last year he said was the one last year good enough for two years you know that one was really without blemish do we get like a you know a, a, a buy one get one free a sacrifice one get a couple free now every year they had to come in and it's because the blood of bulls and goats were not good enough they only covered the sin right as i've mentioned before they were band-aids and what happens with band-aids when you when you have a cut and you put a band-aid on it what do you usually have to do you have to take that old band-aid off and put a new one on because it's it's done its job and can't do anything more, so you've got to take the old one off, put the new one on. You have to keep doing it till the wound is finally healed, right? Well, the problem was the wound was never getting healed. They just kept covering it and covering it. All right, we're good for the next year. We're good for the next year. We're good for the next year. It only covered them for the time being. But as the author says here, He died once at the end of the ages. He died once and for all. All sins, past, present, and future have been removed from all those that believe in Him. This is what is said in verse 26, that He has put away sin. That's not something that you read throughout the Old Testament is that their sins are removed from them. Their sins are put away. In fact, the only time it's mentioned is when the prophets are saying that one day he will completely remove your sins from you. He will completely purge your sins from you. Instead, the offerings of bulls and goats simply covered their sins. What they needed was a complete removal. And he says here that Christ did that, that he has put away He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifices of himself. Sin is no longer tied to us like it used to be. I think the sad thing with many believers, and maybe this you even this morning, maybe others define you by your sin, but I think what's even worse is when we still define ourselves by our sin. When we still tie our sin to ourselves. But see, that's not how the Lord looks at us. 
I mean, he's not dumb. He knows we sin. He knows we fall short of his glory every single day. But we're no longer known as the alcoholic. We're no longer known as the druggie. We're no longer known as the one who's always angry. As the adulterer. As the liar. As the thief. We're now known as his sons and his daughters. We're now seen not through our our past, not through our sins, but we're seen now through the blood of Jesus. And our sins have been put away. Right? He could do a a CAT scan for all of our sins. And guess what he's going to find? Nothing. Because our sins have been removed from us. Our sins have been put away from us. Sure, the world might see us that way still. You might have family and friends that still won't let that thing you did go. But that doesn't matter because the creator of the universe, the one who loved you so much, who sent his son to die for you, he doesn't see you that way. He sees you through his son. In fact, he even mentions in verse 25 that that if Christ's sacrifice wasn't good enough once and for all, well then he would have had to have been slain since the foundation of the world. What he's saying is just like the blood of bulls and goats, he would have to come every year. And in reality, really every day, every hour, every second to get rid of the sins if we wanted to be in right standing with the Lord. He would have had to have been slain since the foundation of the world. What he's saying is he would have had to continually been slain Not that he should offer himself often. He would have had to suffer often since the foundation. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin. He has put away sin. And instead of it being done with the blood of an animal, like the high priest would go in, the high priest didn't have much skin in the game, right? He wasn't the one dying. He wasn't the one offering up himself. Instead, oh, here's a goat. No skin off my back. I'll be here next year. Jesus not only fulfilled the office of high priest, but he fulfilled the sacrifice. He placed himself. Because he was the perfect sacrifice. There was nothing and no one else better. Right, that's what he says in the garden in Gethsemane. The night before his crucifixion. He's there. He's sweating drops of blood. And he says, Lord, if there's any other way. What he's saying is, Lord, if there's someone good enough that could take my place. Lord, if they can work out their own salvation by their own good works. Lord, if there's maybe an ox out there that's just perfect. Perfect. That we could sacrifice. If there's any other way, Lord, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Notice Jesus doesn't wait for an answer. He's not, you know, he's not saying, Lord, you know, get back to me. Did you check? Because he knows the answer. That's why he came down. In Revelation, we're told that he was the lamb slain from the found, since the foundation of the world. Now, that's not saying, that's not co- contradicting what the author here is saying, that he was slain since the foundation. He's been being slain. No, what he, the Revelation is telling us is that from the foundation of the world, it was God's plan. It was not a backup. A lot of bulls and goats weren't option A. And it just didn't work out or we just didn't do it the right way or we couldn't find an oxen perfect enough. You can even see that in Genesis chapter 3 when God is cursing Adam and Eve and the snake. When he gets to Eve, he talks about how from her own seed, which if if you know biology, women don't have seed. It's the men who have the seed. 
So he was already pointing to the virgin birth. But he says, from her seed, he will crush the serpent's head. Speaking of the death and the curse that was brought in from the deception of the serpent. He didn't say, you know, and uh, from these oxen, you guys might be able to, to get through this. From the very beginning, it was always the plan. And he, sa he was sacrificed once, once and for all, to put away sin. Verse 27. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Now, the author really sneaks this really heavy verse in for everyone to hear. He's really setting up his main point. But to set up, to understand the main point, we have to understand what he's saying here. It is appointed for men to die once. It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. This reality is often ignored and suppressed by many in the world. Many go about their lives as as if it's like a video game where you can just reset or you get an, you get more lives, you know. Well, it's okay if I die in this in this level cuz I can just retry it or I can, you know, I have more lives or I I can heal myself. If you don't play video games, you're sorry. <laughs> and I don't just mean that for the physically dangerous you know, people who are daredevils, stunt devils. I'm talking about as if there's no judgment after. That there's no consequences for their actions. That's the beauty of playing a video game, right? Whatever consequences happen within that little screen. <laughs> and many people think and live life the same way. The, the things they do here have no consequences afterwards. The judgment is a harsh reality for all. You mean I have to answer for what I did on this life? You mean that there is accountability? For many, that would be an eye-opener. From this neglect of such a truth has come so many false ideas in the world and even in the church. For many in the world, they deny that there is a God in existence. Because if that's the case, then they have to answer to that God. Right? Even all the false religions out there who have set up their own gods, even though these are false religions, they still have that belief that, well, we believe this deity exists, and so we have to answer to that deity. We have to please that deity. Right? You, you see that even throughout the Bible. Like, remember the story of Jonah, where Jonah's on the ship to Tarshish, and there's the wind and the waves and the sea, and it's a big storm. And what are the crew doing at that point? Well, they all, they're all trying to figure out which God was offended that caused this massive storm. Finally, Jonah pipes up and says, well, actually, it was my God, Yahweh, the God, that was offended, and it's because of me. Throw me overboard. You see this throughout the history of Israel. Uh, there were nations who thought that, well, Israel has their God in their region, and then we have our God in our region. Right? That's what happens with Sennacherib when he's going and he's challenging Hezekiah, and he sends the, the, uh, the herald and the letters there, and it says, they say there, were any of the other gods of the other nations able to stop us? And they're like, No. So what makes your, you think your God could stop us? But we now come to a day in the age where we just deny that there's any God in existence. Because then that means there's no accountability to anything higher than us. That we are now the masters of our own destinies. We decide what is right and what is wrong. I think it's interesting, we just saw this week, maybe you saw it in the news this week, that Louisiana has reinstated that the Ten Commandments be put back in the schools. That's, a, that's cool because, you know, it, it shows that even the laws we have, whether you believe in God or not, came from something. Morality comes from something. 
We don't just drum it up. It's got to have a source. And who knows, maybe the Lord, I, I pray the Lord does something through that. We can't just hope that people are going to see the Ten Commandments in the schools and we as Christians don't have to do our job to go out and make disciples. But hey, that's a good step. Many just deny there's a God in existence. See, if there is no God, then there is no accountability, which means there's no judgment. And I can do as I please in this life. Many of us lived that way before Christ. Many of us know people living that way right now. And they've told us that. And so they live as if there's no judgment, no accountability. But the church has at times also forgotten this truth. There have been some who have made up doctrines to fit their understanding and desires of what the scriptures should say. This is where doctrines of like purgatory come from. You know, people didn't like the fact that, you know, their loved ones died and then had to go to judgment. And so to appease, you know, people and our emotions, well, let's set up a place where we're going to make up a holding tank where people can pay to get their loved ones into heaven. Or, or maybe the, it just gives them a second chance at heaven. Or even you have some who believe, like the Mormons believe, that you can baptize someone after they die to get them into heaven. You know, if they didn't get baptized on earth, you know, when they were alive, well, you as your, their family member, you can bap, get, them, get baptized for them or get them baptized. I don't know how they do it, and I don't really want to know. But <laughs> to make it so that way they can get into heaven. Because the last thing we want is to think that, you know, our, our little, dear little old grandma who forsook the Lord her entire life is not in heaven. We have that great story slash parable, whether it was real or not, you know, there's a lot of debate of the rich man and Lazarus. And in that story that Jesus tells, the rich man pleads that he would be able to go back and if he can't go back, that he would send, that someone could go back and tell his brothers that this is a real place, that the judgment is real, that there is accountability for your actions. Because the rich man lived as if there was none. He had a great life. Lazarus was poor and begged for food at the rich man's gate. The rich man just thought, nah, there's, there's nothing after this. I can just do as I please. And so he wants to warn his brothers. And Jesus says that that, that can't happen. That, that won't change anything. They have what's good enough. They have the law and the prophets. They have the word of God that tells them this. But there is no second chance. It is appointed for men to die once and then the judgment. We also can't lose sight of that word appointed. It might make little, some people uncomfortable. But we know that nothing happens outside of the, the knowledge of the Lord. No one gets to heaven by surprise. God... You know, Jesus isn't still making your mansion for you when you show up. <laughs> oh, I thought you had another, you know, 20 years left. What happened? Well, you know, dirt bikes and, you know. It's appointed for men to die once. We all have an expiration date. You know, we all wish that it was listed on us like the food at the store, right? <laughs> so we knew. None of us know. This isn't one of those, you know, backwood Baptist scary meetings. Hey, some of you are going to leave this place and die on the road. I, <laughs> although we almost did get like hit twice on our way to church this morning. Uh, <laughs> it's Savannah drivers, so you never know. But it's very true that none of us know the day or the hour that the Lord is going to call us home. 
For believers, he is doing that. He's calling us home. For the non-believers, it's going to be for judgment. They desire to only preach the love of the gospel and neglect the judgment that we are being saved from. There is no love or truth found in telling some, someone they will not be judged for their sin. And yet so many in the church have desired to do that. They like the sound of the gospel. They don't like the truth of the gospel. The gospel is good news and it's good news for one reason. Because we're being saved. And we're being saved from something. Someone who's not in need of help or in desperation is not in need of saving, right? Jesus tells that to the Pharisees. I've not come for those who are in good health, but for the sick. As a good physician. So, all men will be judged once before the Lord. And it will depend on one thing. This is what verse 28 says. This is what he was setting up when he says, and it is appointed for men to die once, but after this to judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Just like we are judged once, Christ died once. And that's the contrast he's making. He goes, it's appointed for men to die once. Well, guess what? Christ did the same thing. He died once. Once and for all. Christ died once. And just like we saw in verse 26, you know, if it wasn't good enough, well, then he'd have to sacrifice himself from the beginning of the foundation of the world to be able to take away our sin. Instead, Christ died once and he bore the sins of those that looked to him. Notice that, as he says at the end of this verse, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. What the gospel does to us, how it changes us, is our outlook now on the future. That's one of the great things it does. We no longer need to fear the future. We no longer need to have anxiety about it. We don't need to, certainly don't need to fear the coming of the Lord. In fact, we look to the coming of the Lord. In fact, we sang that in a couple of our songs this morning. And if you're singing the song, I hope you actually mean it. This isn't, this, the worship songs aren't just a, a warm-up for the Word of God. We're looking to His return. That's a key element of the faith. Constantly looking for His return. Because He tells us that He will come back soon. And remember, a day is as a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years as a day. So his soon is a lot different than our soon. But we're, one thing we are told as believers to do is to look toward his coming. We look for, for his return for salvation from this earth. While the contrast is that those without Christ dread his coming since it will be for judgment. Like Paul says in Romans, they suppress the truth. They know there's a God out there. They know there's judgment. They know there's accountability, but they suppress it. And that's why they love to make fun of Christians who say that Christ is coming back. Because to them, well, they know what that means. Coming before the Lord with Christ is no longer a problem for the believer because our sins have been put away. But for those that face God on their own merit will have their sins put on them. They will bear the weight of their sin. And what is the wages of sin, as Paul says in Romans? It's death. Closing this morning, the author desires for the listeners to be looking to the final day of judgment. And he says, look to the future. What does the blood of bulls and goats do for you for the future? With the law, it only afforded them another year. We're good for a year. But with the sacrifice of Christ, we have eternity. 
We don't have to come back every year. None of us are getting rebaptized. None of us have to come back for the altar call again and again and again. Christ died once and for all. But instead, when we look to the blood of Christ, we see what was done for us now and later. Christ has suffered for us once so that we can be free eternally. The only other option is to think you're free now, which is what many of the world does. They think they're free now, but then they will suffer eternally. Again, it is appointed once for men to die and then the judgment. And for us as believers, we don't need to fear. We're told that we're going to get a different kind of judgment than the world. We're not going to be judged on the wrong things that we did, but we're going to be rewarded for the things that we did for Him. Judgment doesn't have to be scary if you've done nothing wrong. (laughs) And yes, certainly we've done a lot wrong, but our sins have been put away. And the Lord no longer sees us as we saw ourselves as the world might even see us. The Lord sees us through His Son, Jesus. The price paid. The blood shed. Perfect and holy and righteous and set apart His sons and His daughters. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You that You've not just given us life here on this earth, but life eternally. And so, Lord, I pray that we would live as believers we would live our lives in light of eternity knowing that our sins have now been put away from us lord and i pray for anyone out there who doesn't know you they've been living life under the lie and the guise that there is no accountability lord but lord they know that you are true they know you exist and they know that they have to be accountable to you we pray they would stop suppressing it that they would repent of their sins and turn to you, Lord, because when they do, those sins are now put away. The the burden and weight of the judgment coming is now relieved because you have taken it upon your shoulders. And so, Lord, I pray for us as believers as we leave this place, you would fill us with your Spirit. Help us continue to walk with you, grow with you through your Word, through prayer, through fellowship, that you would just bless our week In Jesus' name we pray, amen.